علیکم خوش آمدین بازم تشکر بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمدلله و سلام و سلام الله حضرت رسول صلی الله علیه و سلم اما بعد تانکیو میس امینی اند مستر امینی دکتر امینی فور کریئینگ دس انوایرمنت فور دیسکسینگ دی کرنت سیچویشن ان اور هوم لند اند فور اول دی ورک یو دان اند آی وانت تو also extend my greetings to all of your guests, um, those who are on the panel, as well as uh, those who are watching it from around the world, I hope. Um, the topic that I had uh, promised to speak about is a political economy of rented regimes in Afghanistan in its implications for peace security and justice, both now and in the future. Much of what um, Professor Sirat and also Dr. Azam <coughs> have uh, discussed about the uh, current situations, situation of the country, uh, not only over the last 40 years, but in the last 140 years, is uh, very closely related to this political economy of state dependency on outside sources. And unless and until we have understood this properly and uh, understood its implications, um, we may not understand why wars are not winnable. Are they meant to be winnable? How are our current wars, wars in the last uh, 60, 70 years since the end of World War II, have went on forever. If they have st started in one place, stopped in another, and then uh, yet another place has been drawn into war. Why a war, a constant of the third world countries? These are um, very serious and very important questions that we need to understand. Um, and to not to understand what we are in, in terms of political ecology of the modern world, uh, we will be essentially swimming in the same pool of um, uh, really serious misery and indignity in my judgment, uh, peace is nothing but human dignity. When we lose our human dignity, we cannot expect much else uh, from ourselves or from others around and about us. Let me just briefly explain how uh, imperialism and colonialism have affected the current environment around the world, particularly for non-Western world or the South, and that they are not capable of making independent decisions about themselves the way Europeans were capable of doing that or Americans were capable of doing that two, three hundred years ago. But for the last hundred years, 150 years, much of the rest of the world have not been able to um, do the same thing that Europeans could do. And to a large extent, in my judgment, the European success, the Western success, has been contingent, essentially, more or less on wars elsewhere and poverty elsewhere. In a country where I live, constitutes 4% of the world's population, but consumes 40% of the world's well, how is that going to change? Um, and who is going to change it? And what can we be expecting from the future? Let me just turn to the uh, environment where we live in Afghanistan. We were uh, enjoying for a very, very long time empires of faith that empire, imperial systems were based on religion. And you had them until essentially the onset of the Western um, 
empires of commerce, which came after industrial revolution. That they started uh, going, uh, peddling their, their new manufactured ware cheaper and better in some respects to the rest of the world. And pretty soon when they got uh, footing in other parts of the world for their commerce, it had to be protected. So followed by empires of conquest. Now they came with their military and soldiers and exploited uh, regions where they were rich resources and brought it to Europe and built European civilization and, and uh, capitalism and so on and so forth. This was very easy and very clear for people who had been occupied and um, colonized to understand that they were colonized. So they fought back and they fought back and then they were given independence. And the assumption was the independence was going to be truly returning the dignity of those who had been colonized back into free and capable human beings who could manage their own affairs. But that was not to be. Europe itself had already uh, experienced two world wars because of nationalist ideologies of nationalism and that they knew um, how to morph themselves from empires by conquest, which they gave up into a new form of empire that is far more um, dangerous, but less understood, and that is empires by invitation, or even Americans call it empires of trust. That yes, they give people independence, but they also made them dependent. In the case of Afghanistan in 1880, when Abdurrahman Khan was uh, crowned in Kabul, the British told them, British India told them that he was free to do anything he, he wants in its own country as long as he manages to keep it in control and create the barrier between their empire from Tsarist empire. So they gave him money, which he called Puli Khodadad, money coming from God, while in fact it was coming from the treasury of British India. And he used that to do what? He was not there to serve his own people. He was there to serve for those who were paying him to be on the throne, both cash and weapons. So the creation of modern Afghanistan and modern a lot of other states in other parts of the world were to serve these uh, uh, so-called uh, empires who had given them independence, but in fact made totally dependent on them and that their job was essentially to fight their own people and keep them in check and control. And the story of what happened in the 21 years of Abdurrahman Khan's uh, reign is very, very well known to everyone in Afghanistan. His son, continued to follow essentially the same thing. They did very little to help industrialize or modernize or do much of anything in the country. Their preoccupation was how to hold on to their power. Amanullah Khan, when he came to declare independence, what happened? He lost the subsidy and his reign despite his ambitions for industrializing, modernizing and everything else, there was not much to do it with because his father and grandfather had not built wealth. They had dependent on the wealth that was coming to them to run their own country. So his efforts essentially fell short and he tried to get some, um, um, essentially you collect rent, if you like, uh, from the Bolsheviks, they didn't do as much as he expected or any of the other countries. What happened? Civil war, he was driven out of the country. The first one without substantial outside um, subsidies. And the person who 
followed him lasted nine months because nobody was willing to give him a penny. And of course, the treasuries were exhausted within nine months, civil war, and comes a new king installed again by British, with British money, with British weapons, Nader Khan. So you know, he and his brothers, until World War II, managed the country again as a prison. It's wonderful to sort of uh, look back and say, oh, we didn't have any wars. You know, there are very few wars and conflicts within prisons, except occasionally. When you have um, weapons and money from outside and your job is to keep people in check, you do that. And you don't care about anyone else except your own interests as a group, is a, a very small group. In Afghanistan, it would be a mistake anybody to say that the Pashtuns categorically did that. No, a very small group of Pashtuns did all the harm against other Pashtuns as well as against the rest of the society. After World War II, once again, the Cold War came and empires shifted into shape of empire by invitation. By then, most of the third world countries had gotten their independence, but they were not independent. They became dependent again through another form of war. This one was, in fact, two kinds of war. One was proxy wars that uh, the socialist camp in the um, capitalist camp were fighting against one another in other people's countries. Because during the wars, they had built such a huge military industry that it could not, it was part of their economy. It had to be going on. And that they decided not going to fight each other in Europe or in America. That it, but they had to build, keep these military industrial complex going and that this is the largest part of their production. They produce, and in all the wars after World War II that has been fought around the world, particularly in the third world countries, in small countries, tell me whether those countries built up one bullet themselves. Their bullets and their weapons all came and were given, in fact, for free to the third world countries and created those divisions along ethnicity, language, uh, sect, you know what. And they have maintained that. But the other side of this new, the other side of this new um, empire by invitation or empire of trust is humanitarian wars. That they are not only giving um, money for the countries to destroy themselves, but you're also willing to give lots of money to feed them, to keep them fighting, to even build sometimes schools and roads and universities and so forth. So that this is another form of war, humanitarian war. It's not humanitarian assistance, I'm sorry. It is a misnomer. It's a very clever ploy that much of these countries are being, in fact, smothered with love, if you like. That look, we are doing, we have, we have spent billions and billions and hundreds of billions giving in aid. Why are those aids not producing anything in these societies? Why are we still poorer than we ever were? And this is the situation that happened in the 1980s when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, the multiplicity of foreign intervention was in the form of humanitarian war, as well as proxy war. They kept giving Mujahideen. Earlier, only Kabul got this and kept itself on the throne. Now they had created uh, seven organizations that they were giving money to and weapons to and uh, in Peshawar and seven more in Mashhad in Iran. And that the, the recipients multiplied and therefore the war intensified and multiplied. And then 
came the era of America winning the Cold War and the world becoming unipolar. Soviet Union was no longer there, but they had to create new enemies and the new enemies were formed in the, in the form of radical Islamist groups. And the rest of the story is well known to you. I don't need to go there. But the point is, once they grow, uh, came out, the notion of empire by invitation had gotten strength, that there were now smaller competitors who wanted to be invited also to come to the aid or help of Afghans of various factions that they had created in the 1980s. So that regional players got into uh, the game. And in 2001, in 9-11 events, we got a whole new reality in Afghanistan with the amount of aid offered, with amount of, again, uh, really humanitarian war being intensified, as well as um, proxy war being intensified, both locally, regionally, and so forth. So we are in, in a, in a, in a, in a um, vicious circle, a vicious circle that is no longer in our control. We, in the last 40 years of war in Afghanistan, tell me if anybody has built a single gun. They have used millions of guns to kill each other, to destroy their own country. What has war contributed to Afghanistan? You know, in Western literature, we read about wars made nations. Yes, because they produced their own war material and produced industries, which had to be kept on after they stopped fighting each other. And we are essentially, <clears throat> some countries in the Middle East particularly, the oil rich countries have been buying billions, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of weapons and giving their own precious resources to the West to keep their, uh, maintain their, their uh, economies, maintain their, their lifestyle. And yet who is dying? We are essentially employed, no longer is anything else but people to kill each other for them. When are we going to learn? They uh, built their nations through war and made their economies what, what they are. What has war done for us other than destroying us, both physically and destroying our resources, destroying our own countries? When are we coming to understand that the game we're in is a vicious one, a subtle one, and they're doing it. They're, they're, they have done both things. They fight hot wars in the same place, as well as humanitarian wars in the same place. We are always at war. There is no possibility, no potential. I am sorry to say that Doha and beyond is not going to be much different because the world order is a mess. It's the one that's created for insecurity. And the reason they don't want to win any wars. Wars that are won, problem is solved. New empires of trust or empires by invitation are not there to solve problems. They're there to manage problems. And they are doing it very well. And as long as, if, if, and the reason why they can't work, I mean, America if spends one point, maybe two trillion dollars in a country in hot war as well as humanitarian war against a bunch of lunatics, essentially, with very little in hand. How could they not win, win that war? It doesn't make any damn sense. They don't want to win it. Because if they want it, a problem is solved. Empire is about being there, staying there, and, and messing there. It's not about solving and you know, getting a, a pat on the back and saying, thank you very much. You have solved our problems. We should not expect the West to solve these problems because their dignity 
and their pride and their everything is contingent on our indignity, on our poverty, on our inhumanity in many ways. So we need to come to understand that if, as long as we don't understand, as long as we're there ready to be rented, and there are governments, the government in Kabul has been a rented regime. And the governments before that have been all in some form or fashion to some degree rented regimes. They're not rentier regimes because rentier ones are like Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. They have oil to sell and get money and then uh, make, make their uh, life with that. We are on, only collecting rent to do the bedding of those who are paying the rent. And that is all they ask from us is to fight each other, to kill each other, and to contribute to our own indignity. So when we wake up and when we understand where we are and what we are, then we may be able to understand to figure out whether there is a way out of this. Unfortunately, the, the vicious circle is closed in. They're not going to allow, and that's why you, you move from one war to the next, Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, Syria, Libya, uh, Yemen, you go on and on. This is, this is not something incidental. It's not, it's not just happening because, because of something unknown. No, it is part of a system, a systemic way of abuse and um, abuse of especially smaller nations with no ability to essentially maintain or are willing to go to poverty for a while. Chinese did it for God's sake. Chinese did for several decades, suffered poverty, all kinds of things, didn't take anything from anybody, but pulled themselves together where they could now become a, a world power. Our, we are not willing to do that even for a short while because our elite are so uh, tied into uh, this system and that uh, those who are funding it also know it so well that they will continue to feed them on and keep the system going the way it is. So my uh, uh, unfortunate conclusion is that Afghanistan is not going to come out of uh, this mess anytime soon unless and until we understand what we are in. Thank you very much.